Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Observable Flutter. My name is Craig Lebenz, and I am your host again. I'm sorry to disappoint. Um, but today, I'm very excited, joined by a prolific guest whose avatar I'm unfortunately covering currently. Uh, to continue where we picked up, nope, to continue where we left off last week, uh, building an infinite zombie shooter. And uh, let's get through the quick, quick notes before we dive into it. Uh, so remember, folks, Flutter community, kindness to each other. On this show, we're going to encounter tons of libraries, technologies. We don't want to disparage their authors, right? We can debate techniques and patterns and whatnot, uh, but kindness to each other as always. And definitely no, we're, we're not disparaging flutter uh, alternatives, whatnot, good, good stuff like that. Okay. And with that, oh, hey, Randall. Yeah, long time no talk. It's been a whole day. Um, let's let's get into it my guest oh whoops my guest today is uh you know him as wolfen number three in the pack number one in your hearts wolfen uh welcome to observable flutter <laughs> hey i thought i'll just start with my proper face so everyone recognizes me but uh thanks for having yeah, me I I thought your avatar was actually just a photograph of you because when yeah, you were this morning. Uh, it technically is. This is exactly <laughs> the perfect representation of how I am in real life. How you look in real life? Yeah, you're oddly pixelated, but you know. <laughs> it reminds me of um, there was a comedian in the States about like a decade ago. Uh, unfortunately, he has passed, um, but his name was Mitch Hedberg. And he had this joke about uh, Bigfoot. And he said, what if Bigfoot is real? but there's actually just an out of focus monster running around the woods. <laughs> <laughs> that would make sense, you know, with all the pictures. Yeah. 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 yeah it's not actually just the, the pictures aren't bad. The creature is out of focus. <laughs> it's just such a funny concept. Uh, anyway. So yeah, today we're going to, we're going to pick up where we left off last week which was making an infinite zombie shooter with flutter and flame. And if I recall last week, uh, Johan, I, be I believe you were chiming in occasionally. You might be able to help me remember what all we got done. Uh, assets were loading. I was moving the character by pressing keys. I think I only was going up and down. Didn't even bother <laughs> implementing left and right. Uh, and I got some land to load. And the camera was following the character. So the land was staying, the land was kind of uh, moving on the screen as the, the character was technically moving, but then the camera was following the character. So it seemed like the land was moving, even though the land's position in the game world wasn't changing. The character's position was changing. Uh, that was what we accomplished last week. Any thoughts you would add to that? No, I think that sounds about right. I think that's, you struggled quite a bit to get to that point, but yeah, that's I did. That's where, where, that's where you ended it. I did. Um, so, and then I talked with you, and oh, hi, this is StreamYard. I was supposed to put that over here. <laughs> then I talked with you uh, during the week, and we we strategized a little bit about making game maps and uh, other kind of fun things we might get up to in this episode. And you pointed me at a game. Uh, some software called tiled and I, I did spend some time playing around with tiled and this was the asset pack that we had last week uh and i first you know i didn't really know what i was signing up for when i clicked this like very large map size and you can see that i then ran out of steam and <laughs> didn't flush it all out but i just put down a couple little things here and i have exported this it's sitting in the flutter project but i haven't even uh, imported it with code yet. I know there's a flame plugin for this tiled software, but uh, Johan, if you're interested or Wolfen, sorry, uh, would you, would you mind maybe summarizing tiled for aspiring game developers? Uh, yeah, of course I can do that. So basically tiled is the 
put the map editor for any kind of game. So even if you want to make a platform game or a top-down kind of game that you're making or an isometric game, anything that's 2D and can be represented in tiles, you can use tiles to basically draw your game and its format can then be interpreted by a lot of game engines to basically build up your game world exactly like how you've drawn it. And you can also add like custom properties and all that kind of stuff and read that in your own code to basically define things in your map editor in a really simple UI that is really flexible without having to worry about like, oh, what kind of file format am I going to use for my worlds and all that kind of stuff. So, And it's fully free and open source, which is obviously, in my opinion, the best part. And uh, I spent some time looking at <clears throat> the output of it. And you can see last week I was talking about the idea of having like some kind of initialization file, some plain text way to declare your world. And I was excited because, you know, I'd never heard of tiled, of course. And I just thought, well, each character that you choose in this plain text definition of your world will kind of help you visualize it as you type it out in this plain text file. This part cannot easily be visualized, uh, but it's obviously the same concept. And then the visualization, uh, you know, very distinctly superior to what I was imagining. The visualization comes from uh, the tool tiled. So pretty, pretty neat. Yeah. And you can have different layers. So we've got like the ground underneath and you, know, you can put stuff on top and occasionally you'll even place something on the wrong tile or the, the wrong layer as you can yep. see that's always good uh but yeah so it's uh it's pretty neat and i've done this very very small amount of work there's a lot more you can do too as well and i have not gotten into that yet like uh you can define hitboxes around things and then export those into your game engine as well one thing i was thinking for this tree it would be really fun to and i think there's i'm going to Maybe next episode, I don't know, at some point I want to do this. We're going to define a hitbox around the bottom so the character cannot cannot walk through the bottom of the tree. Zombies will also be stopped, right? You can use trees as like terrain for strategy and whatnot. But it will be cool if we define uh, once the character moves through these squares, their priority will go down below the tree's priority. So it will be rendered going behind the tree. But if we move this direction, then we'll stay in front of the tree. And I just think that will be neat to bring together and explore how to do in code. But it's going to start by defining a hitbox and some rules around these different tiles in this program. So that'll yeah. be fun. But that's not this week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to be fair, Tiled also provides a lot of capabilities related to that as well. That instead okay. of, like, you probably drew two tiles for that tree on the object layer. I did, yeah. But I believe there's also a way to basically just draw one tile. And it will still look like it's the full tree, but it's just that one tile because that's the bottom trunk. So you know okay. that that's just what should be visible. And anything else is basically the sprite that you render. So that will always overlap priority-wise. Basically oh. the same layer concept that you just mentioned. There are ways to do it. I don't know them. I'm not that amazing, uh, uh, skilled with child, but I know it's there are multiple Doable. ways of how to solve that. So pretty sure you'll figure right. one out that will work for you. Yeah, well, yeah, that'll be uh, that will be a fun adventure for the future. But today, as promised, game worlds in cameras. So what I want to do today is get this loaded into flame and define the camera correctly. So, you know, in theory, the camera won't be able to kind of scroll all, all the way like this. We, that's obviously bad. We want the camera to be bound to the edge of the map. Yep. And we'll have to do some mathing correctly. Uh, you know, we'll make decisions about the size of stuff in this game. What is the ratio going to be of pixels in the, um, the game assets, which I think are 32 by 32 pixels, if I remember right. Um, might be 16 by 16. I don't know, whatever the size of these is. We're going to make decisions about how that translates into actual game size and world coordinates and uh, get all that stuff sorted, hopefully in a clean way today. That is our goal <clears throat> for now. So should we begin? Sounds like a good idea. Um, all right, I'm going to check chat real quick 
And hey, we got some more flame wizardry uh, tuning in. Hey, Lucas. Uh, that, right. that, I'm glad. So if I don't know the answer to a question, then Lucas can just fill it in for me. Yeah, the uh, developing a flame game with the flame core contributors that is doing it on easy mode. Let me let me just say. All right, <laughs> let's let's get started here. Um, I think actually the first thing to do, well, let's rerun the game and see how that looks for us. So uh, there we go. And how is the how's the code size, folks? I think this is probably pretty good, pretty big. All right, the game is building. Yeah, Mitch Hedberg was incredibly distinct. He had just the most deadpan delivery you can possibly imagine. Oh, the game is rendered on my other screen. Uh, okay, so this is what we had last week, right? It looks like the green square is moving because the camera is following the character. But or is the, the green screen moving and the camera is not following? Uh, I believe the camera is following. <laughs> Yeah, it the is, camera's definitely way. following. <laughs> I checked the code. It is. <laughs> Everyone was able to check it live. Uh, so we got a couple things we need to do. We got to get rid of these aggressive print statements. And we need, uh, well, there's just so much we need to do. So actually, the first thing, let's update the player's movement logic. And I'm curious. I have a strategy that I do for this. Uh, Johan, and I'm interested in how this will hit you. So what I do is get rid of some of these print statements. And obviously we need to add the, um, what is it, A and D to move the other direction here. So if we get an A, then we're going to move negative one for X, and then we'll keep movement.y. And if we get a D, then we again keep movement.y and movement.x becomes one because we're going to move to the right. Now, that part's not too interesting. What I have found works down here is, and I presume this is like the kind of reason why keys pressed. Oh, we've got this chat message just been there the whole time. Uh, keys pressed is passed to this method. If we get, uh, when we release keys W, what I want to know is, is key S still pressed? I mean, because could be. If key S is still pressed, then I don't actually want to go to zero. I'll want to go, I want to resume key S's intent of moving down. So this would be uh, keys press dot contains logical keyboard key s then it if so if s is pressed then we go back to moving down so this is one otherwise zero and we do this for all the key releases how does this sound to you i mean that basically works but i think in general you could simplify this whole method oh okay I think. what do you got I mean, I'm all, I'm just looking at a bit of code that I wrote in the past, so I'm just not inventing the wheel here. But you can just check for, like, you're cre constantly creating new vectors, first of all, mm -hmm. for every check that you're doing, but you're just updating a single value in that vector. That makes sense. So, like, you're, for instance, for, like, if the key S is pressed, you're checking if the move X you're keeping that one and you're changing the i value, but you can also directly set the i value on the movement because a factor two is mutable. Uh, so okay. from a performance point of view, recreating constantly objects, etc., for this kind of stuff is expensive. So now you can just set the i value to whatever you want, which would simplify the code already. So like this. Yeah. Okay. Love that. Uh, let's keep that train going. So when we release A, we check 
uh, oh no, so I, I've got some copy paste <laughs> fun here. So this needs to be w, uh, w yeah. and then A, this is D. And it's and on the X axis. X. Yeah. yeah. And then if D was pressed, that's the positive value. Uh, so now here, this is when we release D. There's so much copy paste error potential here. <laughs> this is A and negative one. Yeah, that sounds about right, I think. Um, oh, Lucas has some thoughts. He says, uh, it's the same in the overridden update above. Oh, yeah, this that this basically creates three, four, five, roughly four or five factors just to update your position mm. because of the assign. You could just add and do all the stuff in it. Yeah, you don't right. have to worry about it for now, but like it's one of the minor things that you should never forget about. Hey, Roa. Uh, well, let's do this real quick. Let's. Uh, what is the right way to to handle this? So we've got. Uh, you could already do an add position dot add instead of position equals. You can add other vectors. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. So this movement vector is. We still just have to kind of bring in all of this, I think, right? Yeah. You you don't want to change the that vector because you're still using that. Okay. Well, great. There we go. Mm, I didn't know vector had an add method. That's nice. I've been uh, not. <laughs> doing that correctly <laughs> for a long time uh yeah and what i had found the reason i found uh the need to check this keys pressed thing is like when i have played random games at you know small projects that i've made in flame i find if i'm moving to the left you know my finger is on a and then if i need to move to the right i press d but i don't let go of a yeah and so without checking that you know, that exact scenario is this line of code without checking whether or not I'm still pressing A. When I release D, the character just stops. But I'm still pressing A, and my brain thinks, like, why aren't we moving back to the left? And then you have to, like, press A again. So that feels very awkward, and this seems to solve it nicely. There's one more thing you could technically do, but it's fine to keep it like this, but that would yeah. just remove all of this logic, is to not check if it's an not check the event at all. And just check okay. if a certain key is pressed, yes or no, and set it. And not do if, else, if, else, but just separate ifs. Because every time a key is pressed or it's up or whatever, it will trigger the method. And if something is still pressed, it will just set that value anyway. That makes sense. So if you're pressing A and D at the same time, uh -huh. and, you're, and you're not checking if the event is up or down, but you're just checking if a certain key is in the key pressed in the set that you receive. So you're checking the event right now, but you can just check the key pressed anyway. Uh, and if it's not in there, you say, okay, then the movement dot uh, X is zero. And then afterwards, you check the D, because that's a d different if statement. And it's still pressed, so it gets set to the positive value that you needed. So it's basically a fall through without having to check if your key press was, or if the event was up or down. Because that's why we give the key pressed, so you can just check what keys are currently pressed, no matter what kind of event you get. Hmm... But mm. it, it, in the end, it does the same thing as this. Like, you won't have a massive difference. It will just simplify now, the code. <laughs> does that, uh, it, it feels to me like that is going to make it trickier to capture the thing that I was just talking about. Like, if the logic says, is A pressed, you know, is A in the key pressed thing? If A is not in the key pressed thing, I think I, we'd still have to have this kind of nested check for D. No, because... Right? Your if statement would basically be uh, for like line 42 here. Oh. It would be key pressed contains key A. If it does, we'll set the value movement.x to one. And okay. then you have the next if statement basically. So I think we would have. All right. So this is how I think that would play out. Let's say I am checking for. Let's say I, I press A. So I'm moving to the left. And then I press D. And now I should be moving to the right. This logic will honor the, the, the most recent key yeah. press. Whereas that logic would honor whatever, whichever of the keys I'm checking last. That's correct. So if yeah. I check D before A, 
but I press A before D, that D press cannot happen. Yeah. So my solution would not honor the user input. It would honor the code input, like the code logic, the order. Mm -hmm. Your version would uh, honor whatever the, the, direct, uh, the, the order of presses the user did, basically. Oh, here's a good question in the chat. And Johan, I'm going to let you field it. What is the point of cameras with flame game? Oh, that's that's a good question. Uh, I mean, the point, the, the most basic point is to be able to see what's going on in the game. Because you obviously, you need to see through something. In this case, that's uh, the camera. And in the case of like the flame engine, we can also have multiple cameras and move, have multiple things in the world visible at the same time at different locations. And you can have custom viewports that have different resolutions. But like the main... Lucas is already ahead of me. <laughs> I saw that. I just noticed too. <laughs> but yeah, that was this, like you can basically force down the whatever is visible and have nothing around it. Like you can call it off, basically allowing to optimize your game if you want it, which is something that Flame will support out of the box in version two, by the way. Doesn't right now, sadly enough, which is something you said in your previous live stream. <laughs> so here is. Um part we're kind of seeing the camera magic happen here so the camera is following the character and in code my character's position is changing we can see that in the update method where the position of we're in player not dart so the player is moving around the camera is following the player and the land is not moving but you know this is just kind of how a lot of games work of course where the camera follows the player and everything else seems to be moving. Um, yeah, it is. so this kind of functionality. And then certainly clipping things that you can't see, not bothering to render those, all that kind of exciting stuff. Good question, though. All right. Should we load in the game world? Is it time? Uh, yeah, we can do a, We could try. <laughs> all right. So I've got the documentation up and you had already pointed me to flame tiled. So this is what we need to use to load in the asset that I had already exported. Yes. Uh, so let's look at the example. The, yeah, the documentation website also has some documentation about tiled. It is not linked though i kind of expected when you pressed it but like it's in the bridge packages on the left in the menu i don't know that wasn't it either bridge packages oh i think i actually read it i think i read that documentation can why can't i find tiled there we go yeah this is what i looked at um over uh during the week while we were strategizing so actually, I think this is probably going to be sufficient. So we're going to have to add flame tiled. So let's go to PubSpec, Diamel, and we're going to add a dependency of flame tiled. There it is. And that's good and all. And now, oh, we'll have to add it to the assets as well. This is the thing that I always forget. So this is, I think I put it in assets. I have no idea where I put it. Why am I even trying to guess? Tiles world.tmx. I wonder if I meant to name that folder tiled. Okay. So now we've got our asset available. And back, I think I need to run this code in probably world, the world yep. component, right? So world.dart in on load, we can bring this down. Tiled component will have to import. And for us, this is going to be a uh, slash tiles or tiles. No, we, ha we have to include assets. I can never remember this. Tiles and then it's world.tmx. And I think the vector size is 32 for this or is it 16? I can't remember. Too many. You should look at your tile size and tile then. Yeah, okay, I've got it open over here. Let me grab this, and then I'll bring it in to the screen so we can all see it. Um, here we are. Okay, 
tiles town uh our size is 16 by 16 only so 16 and then we add the map all right let's build let's see what we get i wonder if it will work me too <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because I'm curious how you have added the tiles, uh, the images to the to the file, to the TMX file. Because the tile component will try tile. to find it the same way that you have it added as an asset. Okay, it didn't work. Oh, oh, assets, tile. Oh, I had this problem last week with the prefix. So assets, tiles... So we just make it world.tmx and can we hot reload we can hot reload oh. all right so we have like a, an underground situation we got the upside down going on here should i make the priority of the world lower or of the player higher uh, it kind of depends uh because that's basically the second point of like tell like you have now loaded the full map in mm -hmm. uh, but if you want to because right now it also renders for instance that tree that you want so in the long run you might want to render it differently and not through the tiled component because otherwise mm. you can't have the because it's one component you could technically add your player to the tiled component as well and that would fix it probably haven't ever tried that but yeah for now oh, you can change priority okay well you're i think you're foreshadowing things to come <laughs> for now let's give this a priority yeah, i'm cursed of... with knowledge i'm sorry yeah it stinks really stinks okay then we have to do this all right we're above the world now the You're sizing is already very silly and obviously we did nothing to prevent this so let's oh and i've obviously got to get rid of this one other straggler piece of land we don't care about that anymore that was in world as well. So we're going to get rid of you. You. Uh, yeah, no, we don't need any of this anymore. Um, okay, that's good. Now we need to think about our sizing. So obviously the world needs to get bigger or the player needs to get smaller. I don't know which of those is better. I mean, it really depends, right? Like, is your player character also 16 by 16 or is that one 32 by 32? Uh, I think it's way bigger. I think it's a rat. It's from a totally unrelated asset pack. So they're, they don't have sizes that like intrinsically play nice. Yeah. Look at this. Just enormous 80 by 110. That's quite a different size. Yeah. So it sounds like, Oh, so what is the best way? If I want to sign, if I want to scale up this world, do Does I actually load. just change this number? Uh, that's a good question. Can you go to the load constructor? It's the de destined Ooh, tile size. Yeah, you could size. probably scale that one up then. Okay. Because that's the destined, like what it will be in flame then. Okay. All right. So that's a positional argument. Oh, wait. That is the it, one. That is the one. Right yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Sometimes it's so it obvious. Me. Yeah. Uh, all right, so is everything going to get twice as big? I think everything got twice as big. Yeah. It's and still, a bit it's still of a not giant. really big enough. Yeah, still have this really big dude. So I guess let's try 64. It also doesn't Ooh. help that your player is not the same. Like, no, it doesn't. But unit. this feels about right. Yeah, that would work. And we've got Assassin's Creed level climbing. Look at us. <laughs> Look at him go. They said Assassin's like, They made such a big deal out of this. Look, we already implemented Assassin's Creed in like one minute. <laughs> we are ahead of Ubisoft. Woo. Yeah, they got nothing. Nothing on me. Tree climbing? Everything. <laughs> this is so good. We had a castle down here. Let's see if we can climb the castle. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned that the castle has a trap door that nobody can reach, but I'm pretty sure you will be yeah. able to reach it now. Oh, I think I added the castle after I exported. <laughs> <laughs> it's not there yet. There's no castle. The castle is still being built. It takes a few years. Yeah, that's right. That's right. They, those things took a long time. Okay. So 
we're just going to stay around this house, basically. Um, another thing I think would make sense is, you know, I don't want a lot of magic numbers here. I just scaled up the images, or sorry, yeah, the, the image sizes. And I feel like this is going to influence my speed factor on yes. my character. And I'd like to approach this in an organized way. I don't just want to make this 300 or something. How do you think about this kind of stuff? I mean, that is quite often what, uh, especially DAO-based games do. They have something that's called a unit value or uniform value that they use to basically do all their calculations for distance. It's basically like mm. what the metric system is, if you're familiar with it. Never heard of uh, it in America. Never heard of it. I have no yeah. idea what the metric system is. <laughs> No idea. Don't talk about it to me. <laughs> well, you basically have to create your own uh, system that shall not be named. But then for like a value that of your own choosing, and quite often that's like the original tile size multiplied okay. by whatever your world scale is. So in your case, okay. originally it was 16. You can scale that up by a certain value. You're not sure what 64, what the scale is of that, but that would then be your basically your unit, which you can use to do calculations. Got it. And does it make sense to like literally just use provider to kind of store something up top? Or do you just have a global variable sitting somewhere? I, I tend to do it as constants because those are the values that barely ever change unless your whole mm. game basically changes. Okay. So like uh, if it's well, part of like how your game works and like it transforms as part of the gameplay, provider providing those values would be better, be but... Yeah. Okay. Wait, Luke is saying something. I haven't read it yet. Uh, the new... he's oh, he's continuing a conversation with Steph. <laughs> what are y'all talking about? Let's learn this. Yeah, Steph yeah. says, why is the world moving instead of the player? This is an excellent question and we should revisit this. But Lucas has already responded. It is the player that is moving within the world and the camera is following the player and keeps it at the center, which might make it a, feel a bit like the world is what's moving. Thanks. Mine doesn't have the player in the middle of the screen. Yes. So, Steph, then you wouldn't be using the follow API, which we added last week and is what does this. So this is in the game, not in the world. And we've added the camera to the game and added the world and everything. And then we said that the camera is going to follow the player. And that, that does it. That's all the magic. Yeah. Uh, and then Lucas's last comment, unrelated to what you and I were talking about, Wolfen. Then you probably have to change the viewfinder anchor, or don't follow a component and just move uh, the position of the viewfinder. Yeah. Um, it might seem weird that pressing the down arrow will make the world go up, as Randall says. Yeah, but that's, you know, you play Stardew Valley, that's what happens. But it's also weird because we can currently see like the void of your world. And you see yeah. that move as well. Like once you're like halfway the the map and you only see the green scenery, it mm -hmm. feels natural that the player is moving down and ch things are changing. Like yeah, like this. So I'm pressing yeah. down now. I'm pressing up. So the world is moving the other way, but you you do feel like you're piloting the player and you're not like, you know, the player is not fixed and you're sliding a plate underneath yeah. it. You know, you're doing this. All right. We're continuing on. All right, so we need this constant. And I think I made a constants file, and it has nothing in it. And we'll say const. Uh, so that multiplier was times 4, right? 16 to 64 is times 4. We doubled it to twice. So this will be our, what should we call this variable? What do you call it? I tend to call like the original unit of my tile, tile size, because it's the size of the tile. Then. You have and a the, multiplier. Yeah, and I'm really creative. I call it skill because it's skills. Like it's. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. That's really good. So now back in the world, this will be. Well, first we'll have to import constants. Uh. Oh, yeah, we can even do that multiplication in. So this would be const uh, actual. I mean, you could call it world size. tile size because it's the size of the tiles in the world. Love that. 
great. And if really you good to... stuff. Really good. Okay. Now, in the player, we can also say we've got our base speed times the world scale, which we will then comment. <laughs> we will import. All right, let's see how this feels. He's not going to like it. Uh, too fast? Pretty fast. Yeah. Pretty Guys, fast. You're multiplying a speed that's not related to your tile size. Uh, the player tile size, you mean? No, the world tile size. So you're moving. Say that again in more words. <laughs> okay, so uh, I know you don't know the metric system. Uh, but in the metric system, we have a definition of like kilometers per hour or meters per second. That's the amount of distance you can travel in a certain time frame. Yeah. And your speed is basically that. It's now it's currently 50 times world scale per second because you're doing the speed for the direction that you're moving uh -huh. times delta value times thousand. Yeah. So it's basically in one second, this is the amount of speed it can, amount of pixels it uh -huh. can travel. Yep. But your value, 50, is not related at all to your world size. It's just a number. So I would oh. multiply it. I would, instead of doing that, I would just have world tile size multiply by how many tiles in a second I can move, like five or four. And okay, then that's, that's the so speed. Much, that's so much better. What I'm finding. I move really fast in a small window the way I've currently coded this. Yeah. Oh, I mean, technically, you move the same speed still. Oh, okay. I know I thought it was faster, but yeah, no, it, it isn't. It I looks I faster because just... it's smaller. All right. That was an interesting optical trick. I really thought that that was happening. All right. Anyway, you recommend that this 50 number basically be replaced by an amount of tiles. Uh, yeah, the whole, right. even the times world skill, I would just say world tile size multiplied by how many tiles in a second you want to move basically okay <clears throat> world tile size by uh four yeah i mean that's that would do the trick probably and because we are multiplying by delta time which is the frame time which is i, I moved more than four tiles in one second here so it's four tiles from end to end of this house. So this is one, two, three, four. So in one second, if I end up here, having started here, then that's it. So one, one thousand. Oh, that's pretty close. All right. Ma math doesn't lie, Craig. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if the fact that the war the tiles are scaled by the world scale, but we are moving without that world scale was going to be a problem and i actually don't know why it isn't uh, because we are moving in the same world that has been scaled up so our position is now relative to what we're visually seeing in the world which was scaled up by the world tile size so this has now become your uniform value everything everything that you do calculation wise oh. with this value will always be relative to the world world tile size we wrote world tile size i had tile size in my brain yeah, okay. If you do this now, it will move a lot slower because it's a lot yeah, lower yeah, yeah. value. World tile size. Right. Sorry. That was very silly. I We wrote world tile size and I had tile size in my brain. Makes more sense. Uh, all right. Now, there's another thing that isn't the best and that is the initial state of the game. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Like, you can just jump off the void. You like yeah, the world's not flat, a, like we finally have proof. Not a ton of polish here. Uh, so what I need to do is both position the world. Oh, actually, this part's going to be real interesting. We're going to need to know the game. We're going to need to know the window area because we have, without checking dynamically, we have no idea what this distance is, right? From the character, from the center of the screen to the edge of the screen. So we're going to have to use the media query. Or Flame will probably provide this to us. And then we need to... Well, actually, I think what we... We need to decide where the player should start. And that will actually be independent, I think, of uh, the... 
the game screen. Maybe we start in front of the house or something. And then we'll need to basically clip the maximum uh, range that the camera can go. Those are surely two concepts that you know well. Positioning the player, that one I think is going to be pretty straightforward. We are going to have an initial position that is passed in here. And that probably comes from the world. Okay, so we I just picked a random position here. And we're going to instead have world tile size times... So for X, I've, I don't know how many it is to the front door of the house. I'm just going to guess 15. And then I think it's like eight down or something. Is this how you would uh, think about doing this? I mean, there are two problems that you're trying to solve here, right? First of all, is that you can't move outside of the world, but yeah. also the visual aspect of how what we're seeing, right? Oh, we're, we're farther over here than I thought. And the anchor, it's interesting, right? Well, it's not actually that interesting. It's expected. The center of the character is in the top left of the world, so we're also going to have to move like 0.5 for each you of could these. move the anchor as well right if you want to if you want to have the position of the player to always be the center of its size yeah that's what works best for my brain i don't know if that's that common i, I, I mean need to go up to so we the flame is all top left base but you can just change it and i tend to have it at center as well because it's just makes so much easier because you don't have to calculate like weird stuff like the half size uh, values Oh, it's zero indexed as well. That's why. Okay. So I think we're going to go here. I like this. Yep. That's where we're starting. Looks great. Even though it would look a little nicer if it was here. So we're going to say six. Brilliant. All right. Now we got to clip uh, where the camera can move. Clipping where the player can move will be very easy, I think. Um, in fact, well, I'll put my money where my mouth is. We'll start with that. So the player position here, this is where we'll say if position dot X is less than our size dot X divided by two, because I'm using the center anchor, then that means <clears throat> we're too far to the left. And so we'll cap the position dot X at zero. But this is the size of the player. Right. So, so this would keep the player from leaving the game area. No, because the size, is, uh, the value of size that you're using here is the size of how big your player is. It's not the game or world size, which huh. makes sense. All right, I'm not following why that's a problem. Let's test this. Can I leave the left side of the game? Well, I didn't think that was going to happen. Yeah, because of this center. So, like, the left side of the game is always, in your case, always zero. Uh -huh. So, like, the math-wise, it works, but because you have the top left anchor, it, that, so it can't ever be lower than zero. That was my point. Well, I don't have the top left anchor. I oh, you don't? Anchor. Oh, you changed it. I missed that. I'm so sorry. No worries. Yeah, so... Uh... Then I don't know why this happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this doesn't feel like it. Useless. Um, I mean... You could try to figure it out, but you can also do something else. Okay. You you can clamp the else. position. So oh, the position I mean, has a is... method called clamp, and then you give a minimum and a maximum value. Oh, I need to probably do this. And yeah. You can clamp. Oh, no. We're just going to clamp it afterwards. Yeah. Then we can get cute. So the, how does clamp going to work here? What does it take? Nice. Great. Um, so the I minimum. I would expect that the minimum would be a zero, right? A factor zero. Well, size. It's the half the size of the character. So this would actually just be oh, size yeah. divided by two. Yeah. Because that would basically move it. And then the maximum is our whole world size also divided by two. But for now, I'm just going to say, I'm going to, I want to test this clamp. So our top one is going to be really big. This is not real code yet. Size divided by two. I'm going to move closer to the beginning of the game world and test 
moving out of the game world. Okay, I don't, yeah, the, this is working well. I can't escape. I don't know why what we had written before wasn't going to work. Uh, I, I know work. why, because if it's smaller than it, we set it to zero, which means the center of the player is zero. So it, that's why it was the half. Like it should have been set to, this, to the half width of the player, but we set it to zero. So the center of the player becomes... That's right. That, yeah. yeah. That's, that's why I was also like, wait, why doesn't this work? But it makes sense logic-wise. So we need to do the old has game ref for a zombie game. Which is deprecated. Boo. You have to use uh, has game reference. Oh. Okay, I can do that. And now this is where we can say game dot world. No components. How do I find what how do I do this? The you world is I made it underscore like a real smart person. Protected it. Yep, the world doesn't have a size. Brilliant. Yep. <laughs> I was waiting uh, for this moment, to be honest. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, I hope you were waiting to deliver your solution. <laughs> we need the size of the talent map. Yes. And then so. multiply that by a value, but that's like the talent component should have a size. I'm not sure about that one. Okay, tile map dot. Mm. What is in the map? The map might have. Yeah, it height. has the height and the width. So this is the yeah. direct value out of the the TMX file that you have uh, as an asset. All right. So we're going to make this. So width. Oh, component was just loaded in this method. So this needs to be um, tiled component and we'll call this map. And so that's now gonna be map. And then you're a map. And now Uh, oh, integers. Okay. Oh, that's and that makes sense because you can't have half size pixels. Yeah. All right, so we have a size on our world. That means that we can just wire it. We can plumb it through to the game. I don't know if it made any sense to protect the world. That may be very silly. Uh, I'm not. I'm pretty sure I just did that real, real randomly. So no, it's size minus the size of this divided by two. And it's gonna take us a really long time to get there. So we're gonna speed up here times 10 and we'll go check the bottom left, bottom right corner. 40 tiles per second. Damn. Boo! Oh, we stopped. Yep. So our calculations are wrong. I think we need to multiply this by the world size. Ding, ding, ding. We have to keep the two double to import const. That was not what we named it. <laughs> World tile size. Yeah. And then can we get rid of you? Nice. Oh, Lucas All right. has another performance uh, question, uh, thing for us. What's that? Why are we still stopping here? Uh, that's uh. 
Didn't even print. So it doesn't even get called. Oh. Right. Uh, ooh, might it? No, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, because we're calling clamp on game dot size, but we have to do it on game dot world dot size because the uh the, yeah because the yeah, game dot so size does just oh, I called it world size. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, size okay. is already a taken f field on the game class, so. Hey, all right. Great success. Look at that. Look at that. Um, all right, Lucas has some edits for us. Since all these vectors are static, you shouldn't be recreating them in update. That sounds like a good idea. <clears throat> so this is our min and max. We should definitely not be calling this. Uh, and I don't want to have a getter either. We are just going to set this. What do you think? Should we do it here? So this is our half size. And then we'll have a vector to half size. And it's late, I guess. And then we're going to need uh, this as well. So this is our um, late. And this is, I guess, just our max position. Yeah. And then max position equals game dot world size minus half size uh, is this download okay, method so where you're doing that or was that the constructor this is a constructor is it yeah. too early we should move it into the unload because the game is looked up at to the component tree which isn't available yet got it i don't think i've implemented unload yet uh Thank you, Lucas. And then you had another thought. And that thought was, and your size getter can be late here instead of a getter so that it doesn't create another vector to every time that it's called. Yep. That would be in the other file. Here. Yes. Uh, correct. So let's grab the goods that actually matter. And we'll get rid of this. And this will be you can just make it a late field directly, like, right? Scaled size, I guess. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. So we'd say this is, uh, maybe we well, just call it like scaled size. I mean, that also works, yeah. But you can also, also initialize values on the field itself like this, like on line 17, if you just do is and then the, the factor declaration. But that's is everything going to be ready by then? Like, uh, when does yeah. map even exist? It will no, be ready the this. moment. You don't we have to do it. this in onload? No, you don't, don't have to. You can just this. do it as a late because the moment you try to access the property, that's when it will be initialized. Uh, Not anytime sooner. So, the first time it will do a one time computation and then it will be cached. I, I assume that's what Lucas meant, at least. Nice. Thank you, both of you. Okay. Refresh. Big yep. problems. This now became scaled size. Anyone else with the problems? Oh, yeah, this poor neglected we, test. File. We don't care about tests. <laughs> get, get out of here. Okay. Um, where you at? Game is building, it's crashing. Late initialization error. <laughs> when are we accessing it? Too early. Yeah, probably. Shame. Probably because scaled size. Oh, because uh, the player is being loaded before our uh, tilt component in the, the game.load. So game.world size is a place where this is loaded. Zombie game. 
So it starts in line 17 here. Yeah, because this also needs to be, we need to no, do the same I late. I think it's the order of uh, how components get added to the frame tree because we are loading the player first and then the tiled component, right, in the world. Okay. And because the player requires the size for clamping and its update loop, it's already loaded and then we are loading the world or the tiled component. Uh, I see, I see, I see. So we just load the player after the other stuff. This yeah, feels a little brittle, but maybe... It's... Yeah, <laughs> normally you would probably have a loading logic for that, but... Yeah. And if that doesn't work, you can just do it in the constructor, you know. I love this error. It's so cool. They should just have a silent mode that just hides all the build errors. Nope, that's still the same error. Yeah. So this one's coming from Zombie Game 28. Because we're hitting the player. Yeah, I guess just this is just too early. Uh, all right. You can just do it so, in a constructor like you did initially, right? Yeah. That was where again? In the, the right game. Here. Not in the world. I think also, don't we just not? Oh, no, this is getting called right away. So that's not going to change anything. Can we do it in the constructor? We can't do it in the constructor. Actually, I do I, want to you can do it in the unload and have it. Yeah, no, that wouldn't work either. Shit. So it's coming from, yeah, zombie game line 28. So the problem is we're hitting the world and we're calling uh the player we're drilling yeah we're telling the camera to follow the player so the camera of course has to know the player's position and then if we look at the player code we does it call update because that's when max position what? is called in max position wait i'm forgetting where even you... all this code is can you remove the unload that we have here right now because it's literally not doing anything but it might be the problem oh yeah it isn't doing anything <laughs> that was going to be yeah, i don't i don't remember why i wrote that yeah because i said you had to do it in the unload and then i don't remember either what's the reason for it yeah there's a lot going on <laughs> All right, still doesn't work. Yeah. So 28, and then it goes into, we don't get a line number here. That's interesting. Zombieworld.player. And then oh, player yeah. has. Ah, yeah, Lucas has the potential solution for us. The world hasn't run on load yet. Instead of giving the player position and size in its constructor, set the position and size in the player's on load instead. Okay. So I presume we can do the size here still. I mean, That's this, probably he meant, okay. He meant he means the sprite in the player position and size in its constructor. Set the position. And size, oh, yes. And then he has clarified sprite. So sprite probably stands in for size there. Instead of giving the player position and sprite in its constructor, set the position and sprite in onload. So we don't bother exposing a position. We have to tell it something. I'm not quite yeah, following, but, Lucas. Like, so what he's trying to say is that instead of in the world onload where we are, passing the position and sprite to the player. We instead have in the onload of the player load uh -huh. the sprite and the position. Because we are now so the calling... The player just will have to hard code its stuff there. Yeah, because we're calling the world tile size there. So if we move the position in the onload of the player, it okay. should technically work. But that's... I've been saying that for like the last five minutes, so... Okay. I oh, we think this might work. I hope so. 
I've lost track of our tree of what depends on what right now. <laughs> Just don't don't have any idea. Um, I'm trying to review it while we do this. So the we do so world size. Where do you get red? World size doesn't get red anywhere. Yeah, no, we still have this excitement. We have a different arrow, and it's though. still coming. No, it's the same, and from the same line. So yeah, no. on this, but we do have a different arrow. If you, because it doesn't say the field player has not been initialized now. Oh, what was the last time? It was <clears> the, <throat> uh, the the scaled size. Okay, but so we, player hasn't been initialized, and that's. In, oh, so in g the game we've added the world, and then we immediately try to follow the player <clears throat> which i guess is just too early yeah because the onload does the player assignment of the world's onload but because yeah. it has just added it isn't loaded yet you could probably right. do the follow in the world instead of in the game right if yeah and so this would be game ref and then, well, now it's just player. And that sort of also makes sense because we're creating it there and then let's hope this works. <laughs> uh, we got a question in the chat. Dude, why is Flutter getting more towards game development? Because games are fun. Life's short. I wouldn't Have say fun. that Flutter goes towards game development. Like That's the framework true. itself, at least. That's very true. It's the community games that are has just fun, so we're focusing on it. All right, max position has not been initialized. All right, Lucas is still holding our hands. Now you can initialize the player before on load, since it doesn't need anything in the constructor. We can initialize player before on load. So then, do we like pass the player into the world? Is that what you're thinking? What was the error again? I oh, we already did it. Yet. Oh, we did what he's saying. Yeah. Oh. Okay, great. So. All right. So, player dot update. This is in line thirty three of player. Yeah. All right. So max position has not been initialized yet. So max position was here and. Yeah. Did. That's in the... Oh, I think we. we this is what. That's, this... Yeah, I was about to say that's what we tried to do there, right? Yeah. I mean, we can do that the same way again, in the field, if you want to. Yes, is long. But I, I would keep it like this. I think I, I... Yeah. You're yeah. Gonna, this you're gonna risk okay. it. <laughs> yeah, let's find out. Find out the hard way. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> we are back. All right. Looking good, folks. All right, so we're going. This is just great. This is really good. We've made a lot of progress. Now we want to clamp the camera. So this is in world. Do we need to subclass camera or does this allow no. us? We could no. just, I think we can just use a method that's on the camera component itself already. Okay. Um... Oh, is this where like viewfinder and port that, stuff? I mean, in theory, in? yeah, but we also have a helper method called set bounce. Oh, so love that. I think it's at the bottom of this file. I don't know why I was scrolling instead of yeah. searching for it. Sensor clears the world bounds for the camera's viewfinder. The bound is a shape given in the world coordinates. The viewfinder's position will be restricted to always remain inside this region. Note that if you want the camera to never see the empty space outside of the world's rendering area, you should set up the bounds to be smaller than the size of the world. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. All right, so we're passing in a shape which has what parameters? It has different yeah. implementations. Yeah, I guess so. So for us, it's going to be a rectangle. Yeah. Unless you want it to be a circle. 
which for our rectangle map would be would lead to a poor game experience. <laughs> Very poor. I would call right, so it then... a haunt game experience. Oh, okay. So I think I'm going to put this in the update method because the user can resize their window at any time. So we probably need to put this in the update method of the Flame also game provides itself. an on-game resize method that gets called on every component. Okay, love that. Love that. So, so that means that we can... be more efficient. Yeah. So let's call it once in on load. So let's have a method here that'll be void set camera bounds. And this is going to say camera component dot set bounds. And this is where we owe it a rectangle. I don't know what this class is like. I've never really, I don't know if I've ever instantiated a rectangle. It's funny, this is also a rectangle is basically just a I guess in our case, it's like two vector twos. Um, hmm. There's got to be a convenience constructor here. That's fine. We'll do the left top with height. So our left That's the wrong rectangle. Oh, cool. That one is Which one do I want? From, I think that one is from Flutter. I don't, I'm not entirely sure which one if we are using ones from Flame or if uh, Flutter has its own uh, the other way around. So shape is coming from Flame. Yeah, so you need a rectangle that's probably also coming from Flame. But the one you just rectangle used extends from Flutter. Shape. I see. All right, so yeah. this is what I want, and this is going to come from Experimental Geometry Shapes. Yeah. Uh, cool. Experimental. So we don't have Experimental here yet. So now this will be, oh, I thought I captured the, this. Cool. So our left is going to be, by the way, I, I do feel the need to click on Lucas's thing here. We really need to create a method that does this automatically. <laughs> yeah. well, that'll be a great addition. Um, so the left for us is half of the game world. So this is game dot size. No, but it's the dot... world region, right? So Why? the region that we want to constrict the player in is just uh, within world coordinates. I think it's set so on the on the method on the set bounds method as well. Yeah, yeah it's, it's given in the world coordinates. So it's okay. I. I'm realizing that this is the exact stuff I wanted to talk about in this episode. The precise definition of world coordinates is what? It's the coordinate space within the world component. So anything, when we talk about world uh, coordinates, it's like, where is your player currently in, within the world? Where is this tile or this entity in the world? And then we have Game coordinates, which is relative to like everything. So that can be uh -huh. even outside of the world. And then we have also screen coordinates, which is, as the name implies, relative right. to the screen size. Yeah. So, okay. So the world coordinates is like I haven't, the closest it feels like I've come to world coordinates was setting the. Uh, so, I mean, this is some world coordinate stuff and like the scaled size. So I think scaled size, this is world coordinates, right? Yeah, that's the, si the, the, the total size, the max width and height of the world in world coordinates. Okay. So that means that it's, where are we? We're in the game. That was the world. So this is like world scaled size dot... Well, for the left, it's actually just going to be zero yeah. plus half of the window area. So that one's easier. Uh, I think it so... will just be zero as well. I think oh, the really? camera and the viewport might already solve that, but we'll find out. But All right. So let's say then, so for right, it'll just, let's say, scaled size dot X and Y. Yeah. And we'll see what this does. Exactly. I'm curious right. as well. <laughs> Oh, and then 
we are going to need to do this on the game resize thing. I but. think we can just do it once on load because it's always relative to world coordinates. So it does like the camera already is sort of smart enough uh, to know. I see. I see. That's what I'm hoping for, by the way. But I mean, we have to call it on in on load at least once. So the zero. Oh, oh I didn't... it doesn't take it into consideration yet, according to Lucas. So we do have to uh, do all the math yeah, ourselves. Okay. Oh, that's Got literally it. what he just mentioned previously as well. Thanks, Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. All right. So that is coming from we don't have oh, we have a game ref because we are the game. Nice. Now the game needs the window size, but is that just size on this? Uh so yes. this would be like size dot for left, this is size dot x divided by two. And this would be size dot y divided by two. And, and now I wasn't calling this here, so that was also part of our problem. Oh, whoops! I killed it. Uh, that is what the comment in the dark doc. Yes, okay, that's right. I did think that, and then I forgot about that comment <laughs> when Wolfen tried to steer me into a different uh, direction. In the wrong direction. Map yeah. has not been initialized. Okay, so scale uh, size was calling map. Yep, that makes Indeed. sense. Indeed. So, got... That's where do annoying. we want to actually call this method? Uh... So, for anyone not following along at home, what just happened here is in this set camera bounds method, which is in the onload method of our game, highest level object of our authorship, we've called uh, the world's scaled size property we've evoked. I don't know why world is private. Scaled size is sitting here. It's late, but it uses map. And map doesn't come into existence until its own onload method. And its own onload method has not run yet. Uh, is there a way? What is like, how do you think about this? We got these trees of dependencies and I need your onload and you need mine. How, what, how do you do this? Easiest way that I tend to do it, which might not be the best way, but it is the easiest way, is to just have an update method and basically just check if world was mounted or not every frame and then have some logic determining that. It's kind of hacky what we could do here mm. if the underscore world has a f or every component has a loaded future that will comp uh, that we can await or look at to determine okay that might be the cleanest way right now yeah the loaded eventually like normally you would probably want to have it set up in a, in a way that it's you, you're not dependent on any of this but like preload the map and that kind of stuff but yeah that'll be a good episode as well <laughs> actually refactor this to be not so hacky we're immediately just creating a ball of duct tape here. But it's called it's called making progress. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> hey. And the character can still go to the end and then we'll start following them. Oh, that's it. That's it. And now go, go to the other side, like what happens? And it's gonna take a while because we've lost our 10x multiplier. Boop -a -doop -boop -boo -doo -doo. And here we're really losing any sense of progress. Yeah. Okay. Almost there. You still have oh, to remove half size of the... I thought I did. No, you didn't. Oh, right. We were testing. Yeah. And then we never came back and applied, even though we knew the answer to it. Uh, you knew the answer to it. I tried to convince you of something else. <laughs> I guessed the answer to it. Actually, no, I did know because I read it. And then you successfully convinced me of something else. <laughs> I'm really good at that. Okay, I don't know why I keep closing the game instead of just not restarting it. Uh, great, this is exciting. It's an exciting movie. Really adorable old video back in like the Eve on the world days. Okay, I can't watch that. Flabberton. Boo! Whoa, man, this is... This is feels way wonkier than it was before. Oh, it's because it's leaving the center of the screen sometimes, yeah. and that creates a real 
Especially on the speed, you don't see that nicely fluidly go out. And then it's like, yeah. oh, why did it teleport, you know? Yeah. So the 10x speed we've already concluded would not be a good game mechanic. There should be no 10x speed power up. <laughs> that will not be fun for anyone. Okay. We're moving around. Yeah. The handoff between being followed and not is quick enough at this speed. This is really nice. Yeah. Okay. We still have our climbing API working nicely. <laughs> Please don't call it the climbing API. <laughs> no, that's what it is. Uh, it's not a box. Right. It's a feature. That's right. Um, oh, yeah. And I did want to actually be down in this spot. So this is this. And this is this. So we're going to start in front of the house. Cool. What's... What do you think makes sense to do next? Maybe we just organize this code and then next week uh, can be about, actually, I don't know, next week may have a guest. The next week that works on this game can be about actual hitboxes. We'll crush the climbing API. Because this that's, is not, uh, zombies are just going to follow you around not going to be able to hide and like clump them up. That's going to be the whole point of this game. Clump them up, AOE them down. It's going to be good. Um, let's organize this stuff. Let's make this more better. -er, which is the technical term. So what in this implementation is making you itch aside from literally everything? Um, gosh. Um... Well, first of all, you could just do an add all instead of two different ads. Oh, okay. Well, we're getting, uh, we've got an idea that aligns with what you were saying earlier. Preload the dependencies for better code organization. Yeah. Yep. That's probably a good idea. So <clears throat> should we try to bring most of our stuff up, our, our stuff up into the game methods load? Or what do you think? I mean, it really depends on, um, and does it really depend on, but it's like what you prefer. Like, for instance, the world, only loading world-related things is totally fine. Like, previously, you mm -hmm. had, like, the camera following in the in the game instead of in the world, which mm -hmm. makes sense because the camera component is part of the world, uh, of the game, but the world is the one that loads the player and that kind of stuff. Oh, right. Especially also... like dependencies. Like, for instance, if we want to have that map uh, available sooner, we should probably preload the tile map and then we can pass that along and that kind of stuff. We should also fix One thing... this. Yeah, as I'm looking at this, it's like <laughs> obviously this code should just live in the world. I mean, it's, it's just jumping out at us. Once the world is loaded, then do this. You know, where there's another yeah. place we could do that. In the world's on loan. <laughs> so you, you can even detect a uh, game resize events in the world as well because it's a method available on every component. Okay. So, because that's also something we haven't implemented yet. So now, as I'm constantly referencing the game from the world, it does immediately feel like. Oh, yeah, there was a reason why it wasn't the worst thing to do it up there. So then this would just go here and yep. we can get rid of this line. Yeah, the world in the game, maybe maybe this is just unavoidable. They're really tightly coupled. They know so much about each other. I um, mean, that's only because you have constructed it in that way. Only because like the I'm only thing that world bad. needs to know is the size of the game, of the size of the screen. Mm, that could be but, just be passed in on and updated periodically. Yeah. But mm. because in your case, you also want to have the bounce and that kind of stuff on the camera component. That's also why you have this bi-directional connection between them. Yeah. And I would love to not have that. I mean, you could have a custom camera that does it for you because the custom camera knows that what the world is like the camera component has access to the world it can already do all that logic for you 
but that would do, then you would have to create your own camera components. And that's, mm. It's not difficult. It's not. But then, then okay. this kind of logic would live in the camera instead of in a game or right. a world where neither really fits. Yep. Yep. It definitely, that would be nicer. I don't think I want to go down the rabbit hole of creating an actual game or an actual camera now. Um, but I, I can definitely see that as a uh, nice addition. Yeah. In time, I think maybe. Uh, and Lucas just mentioned maybe, in maybe. the comments as well, but uh, Luan Potter is one of the is the main guy that made the flame engine originally has done a talk about it at Flutacon, which is now live on the Droidcon website. I think he meant meant to have the link here, but I think the comments don't allow links. Yeah, but that's yeah. Uh, if people are interested in how to do cameras on that level with like custom cameras, then Luan has some beautiful talk about it. All right, I'm gonna watch that talk before attempting to attack the custom camera myself. Let's see if there's any other cleanup that we can get done here. And then maybe this is actually just a, a clean breaking point. Um, there's a lot that works really well right now. I'm really happy with how this works. I mean, this feels like how a game that I would play should operate. I mean, this, this just feels very natural, uh, other than the fact that our dude is... <laughs> Just skating around on one foot. <laughs> He's wearing heelys. It's like we. Oh yeah, he is wearing. Heelys. I don't know how he is doing it backwards though. That's that's really skillful. It's impressive. Well, it's the same way he climbs, just with <laughs> sheer athleticism. <laughs> it's pure skill. It's all skill. Yeah. Oh, I wonder if we could have like a jump API to be like. I mean, I say API, it just be a function, but like, oh, we and kind of jump over a fence. That could be a nice way to escape zombies. Anyway, <laughs> let's see if we can find anything else to clean up. And then otherwise, I think we might be in an all right spot. I kind of want to revisit some of the map sizing things and just make sure I can think through it all. And it seems to make sense. So the game, this is the top level thing. Uh, this has a camera component that gets past the world. And the world we initialize right here, but this is just initialization. It's not any of their onload shenanigans yet. Um, then in our onload, we don't even really need this anymore. This is now coming in from the tiled setup, but whatever. Um, the cameras, viewports, anchor. Oh, yeah, what did this do again? How important is this for us? I... This would change our bounds logic, wouldn't it? I don't think so. I, I've never used the anchor on the viewfinder myself, so... Okay, let's get rid of it and see what changes. Completely ruins the game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Smoke starts coming out of my keyboard. All right, so that literally did nothing. Um, I'm not going to lie, surprised. But that's okay. So we add the camera component. We add the world. And that's all good and fun in the world. First of all, we'll look at its on load because hopefully scaled size. Actually, where all is scaled size called? Where? Scaled size oh. is called. Are we by... still using the world size from the game? World size from the game. Oh, yeah. We're probably mm. still using that in the, the player. Yeah. Never mind. We'll get to that. Yeah. Yeah, we are. Yep, yep, yep. So scaled size uh, is how big the world is. I feel like this. I, I want to call this world size. Yeah, like, like in, on the game on the game, it's also called world size. You could just call it size as well because it's on the world. But isn't size? No, because the world is not a position component, so it doesn't have uh, a size. Okay, that's why you couldn't find it earlier either. I see. All right, so we're just setting our size now. That's way better. Okay, so world.size, that's really good. And then this is now just world.size. Okay, now we're back to the world, though, looking at that. So this, in its on load, it brings in the map. It, of course, adds the map. It brings in the player. 
and this is all pretty straightforward. Just get the image, load the player. And then now that the player is loaded, we ask the camera to follow the player. And this was an area where we were having headaches. Yeah, because, because what you just mentioned is also incorrect. It is not loaded yet. It's just added, which will trigger oh, right, right, the right. load eventually. <laughs> right, right, right. So the, the, uh, the player is added, not loaded. The camera is now following the player. So yeah, the, the player player's needs position. To be good to go without any so is there like one frame where because the the player's position is not set yet i mean so in the... this case uh you could move the position to the unload uh to the to the constructor in the player because we're not dependent on anything for that position calculation the world tile size is a constant mm. So if you want to make sure, but because by default it will be at a factor zero, so you can just pass it to the super here. And you don't even have to do that. You can just pass it to the super of the player, right? Yeah, I guess that it's fine to hard code it here. We're gonna hard code it somewhere, yeah, either in exactly. the worlds on load or in this constructor. So yeah, that's fine. Um, Okay, that's good. And then we just have now we don't have an onload here at all. Yeah. That's actually quite nice. Okay, so and now we've gotten rid. Oh, sorry, you go. One other thing, because you were talking about things which you maybe want to change in the world, we have the player image, right? You're retrieving the player image in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You should maybe you should maybe just move the player image retrieval to the player's onload and set the sprite there because it's all it's not something the world has to worry about, like which image the player is. That's something the player mm. component, the entity should worry about. Okay. So we can do this in onload, the yeah. function I just got rid of. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, that's good. Uh, and so then this just becomes sprite. Yeah, you just have to wrap it in the sprite still. But And does this have a game ref? It does have a game ref. You have to... Uh, Wrap it in a sprite. Oh, right. Okay. And now we can get rid of Mo this. Yep. And then now just to not be confusing for ourselves, we can even get rid of this. Yeah. And now the player uh, entity is basically self-contained. Yeah. Nice. That's much better. Should by the way try to run it to see if it still works. <laughs> so it's another good idea. All right, it works. Woo! Perfect. We didn't break anything yet. Perfectly. Okay. How does this speed feel? It's hard it's okay. to say without the, like any kind of walking animation. True. Whoa. Oh yeah, we didn't do the on resize. Great. Yeah, Let's do which... it. We can now do it in the world because we moved. Uh, yeah, we moved it to the world. So this would be game dot on resize. Yeah, you can. Uh, no, the the world component itself has an on game resize that gets called oh. whenever there is a resize event. And I think your camera bound should receive a factor two size uh, argument. Because when this is called, I'm not sure if we have fixed it, but originally the game that size would still be out of date. Oh, Lu okay. Lucas might correct me on that in a few minutes, a few seconds on the, on the chat, but originally that's what I remember of it. So I still always pass it along, just to be safe in that sense. Wait a minute, I wasn't even. How does this method work? I'm not using it at all. Oh, this would replace game dot size everywhere, of course. Yeah. Great. And so then here we'll just pass game.size. And on this one, we call set camera bounds and we pass this size. That's what you're saying. And you also have to call the constructor, uh, the, the super of the on game resize. I was so excited about my cheeky little. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. 
Hey, Med. We're doing great. Welcome. Welcome. To Welcome. Jurassic Park. All right. What? We have made something worse. Null check operator used on a null value. So in world 46. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. That's, that's a, yep. That makes sense. So I'm when the game starts, the, uh, the on game resize event is basically also being triggered, but your camera component isn't loaded yet. So this method should only be called if the camera component is it's fully loaded. loaded. They're mounted even. So you can just do a check if if not mounted. You can just return it. Because we are also calling it in our own onload of the world. Mm -hmm. So it will be called eventually correctly. Ooh, but still... We're going in the wrong direction. <laughs> Why? Ah, uh, I think I know why. No, that doesn't make sense. So, did not expect that one. Is coming from on game resize. Okay, so this is now broken. So now it's broken everywhere. Maybe you should print the game size. And then when I resize it, it fixes. Wait, so it's it's not working initially, ah. but once I resize it, then it works. I see. So that means our okay. on load isn't happening uh, at all yeah i think because we're calling on line 36 set camera bounds can you uncomment that one maybe that's the, the evil comment this out yes and then we could also comment out this yes let's see if we still get the error i feel like and if it's the we black commented out the initial call and the check for the initial call. So it would be super. Wow. Okay. I'm surprised. I didn't think this was going to work. I have no idea why, but let me... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I suspect uh, it, it threw the error because we are now calling it weirdly enough earlier. No. This is looking pretty good, though. Yeah. This, this feels like the start of a game. You could play this. I'm doing it right now. Having so a heck of a play it though. That's true. You should put it on Steam right now. It's feature, it's <laughs> feature complete. You can you this can is, climb up to the roof. Is, <laughs> right, it's a climbing game, climbing sim. Uh, it's absolutely early access ready at a minimum. All right, this I think is what we aimed for today this is a mission accomplished situation wolfen any final thoughts uh you should use the at all method more often that's, that's all right my final remark <laughs> i can do that like you think I can't <laughs> it do just that? bothers me so much to constantly see all these separate ads and like uh it, it performance wise, it doesn't make any difference. It's just, I just like it, you know. All right. Well, now you're happier camper. That's what I'm going for. <laughs> no, I'm still not, because in the zombie game, you also have two ads. But uh... <laughs> all right, I do. You know what? You're not wrong. I, I'm no telling room. you, it bothers me. <laughs> okay. Look at that. And this private world situation in my opinion the world doesn't need to be private because everything related to your game your everything that will happen will happen in the world so they will have to access the world for more than just the size potentially okay but you... so i'm going to get rid of this and we'll then 
this will just be world.size. Get rid of this unused import. <clears throat> Another unused import. When did we import math? Oh, when I added the wrong rectangle. <laughs> see where yeah. that came from. All oh, right. This is pretty well, good. Starting to uh, become <sighs> Wolfen, thank you, Lucas. Thank you as well. It won't make a difference since it isn't in a tight loop. Yeah, he's oh. talking about the at all. Like, it's uh, slightly worse because it's like, uh, first of all, you're defining a list, and then like it has to do some logic to go through the list and weight them. But you're not mm. doing it every frame, so in my opinion, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you do the unload correct. frame. If it takes like four microseconds or only three, it's like whatever. Yeah. Um, hope one of the upcoming sessions will be on the Rive renderer featuring someone like Gordon Rays. I don't know if I know Gordon. The name yeah. sounds a little familiar. Maybe are they on Twitter? Yeah. Uh, Gordon is one of the spokespeople from Rive. He's been doing some cool stuff with it. Great. Uh, well, Mars Marcin Marson, please tell Gordon to reach out to me because that sounds wonderful i'd love i've never really gone into rive yet myself but i'd love to and obviously this would be a perfect opportunity to use rive okay uh well i think this is a pretty darn good time to call it uh wolfen thank you so much for, you for having coming me on yeah talking about all things flame one day, maybe uh, I'll know. I'll feel like I know what I'm doing here. I won't actually know what I'm doing. I'll just delude myself into feeling that way. <laughs> uh, but this has been fun, everybody. I don't know what next week is going to be. I may have a guest unrelated to this. We might get back to other facets of Flutter development, or in the absence of somebody else, this project will once again fill its role of giving me something to talk about on weeks where I don't have another guest. But Stay tuned. Uh, we'll all figure that out together next week. And um, yeah, until then, have a good one, everybody. Peace.